Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. I am Dick McCallum, president of DSU. It's a sincere honor to be able to extend greetings and words of welcome to each and every one of you. What a great group you are. This is a wonderful assembly, and we are so very, very pleased to have you here as part of our fourth annual Theodore Roosevelt Symposium. I would like to express words of thanks as well as words of welcome. And in your packet, you will see a brief one-page summary of individuals that I would like to recognize at this time. I'd like to begin by recognizing the major sponsors who have helped to underwrite the cost of this great endeavor. You will see them listed there, the city of Dickinson, Dickinson State University Foundation, MDU, Montana Dakota Uni Utilities, and the North Dakota Humanities Council. I would like to give this group of sponsors a round of applause for their support. You will also notice on this same particular handout the names of the individuals who have been working on a planning committee for months. You need to know that in order to put this kind of symposium together, both in terms of content and logistics, there is a tremendous amount of energy invested in order to make this happen. And I wanted to publicly recognize the individuals who have invested time and energy to help develop this symposium for us. We very, very much appreciate their effort. We also have what we consider to be colleagues, partners, and stakeholders in our effort. And you will see them listed as our Medora partners. And I wanted to recognize these individuals because throughout the year, year after year, these individuals have been collaborating with us, supporting our activities, encouraging our dreams, and helping us to move forward with these efforts. And I wanted to thank them as well. You will also notice a number of individual departments and units listed on this announcement relative to their support activities to help us bring this symposium to a reality. And so I wanted to sincerely say thank you to everyone that is listed here. But I also want to say thank you to many, many individuals not listed on this sheet who have over the years donated and contributed financially to our foundation in support of our Theodore Roosevelt initiatives. You will recall there are three lines of effort. The first line of effort started almost nine years ago when DSU made the commitment to create a TR scholar program. That program started with a very modest enrollment. It has grown incrementally over the last nine years. And I'm happy to report that we have 106 TR scholars enrolled this fall in that program. And as those individuals move through their program majors, they also complete a minor in leadership. And part of that leadership study includes the analysis of TR, hence their involvement in this symposium. We also have, in addition to this symposium effort, an ongoing dream that is incrementally becoming a reality to create a virtual comprehensive Theodore Roosevelt Library. And you will continue to hear more about that effort as the day proceeds. And we are so very, very excited about the many activities just this past year that have come to be a reality as we have moved into this venture. I am convinced that this is going to happen. And with your continued support and your continued enthusiasm and your intellectual energy, this is going to be not only a great resource for the university, faculty, staff, and students, the community of Dickinson, the state of North Dakota, but for all individuals who have an interest, whether it's casual or scholarly, in TR. And we thank you so much.
for this great support. It's now my sincere pleasure to introduce our symposium moderator, Clay Jenkinson. We had the opportunity to introduce him last night. He got us off to a great start. Clay, I'm very, very pleased to have you here today and to invite you to the podium so that we can continue with today's events. Thank you, President McCallum. Uh, on behalf of um, Sharon Kilzer and John Brudvig, Marty Odom and Gardner, and everyone else who's been involved in all of the planning of this and in the Roosevelt Initiative, thanks to you for your leadership in, in making this dream um, be realized. We're just thrilled. Welcome to all of you, high school students from around the area, our own TR scholars, uh, st other students from this university, faculty, uh, and citizens not just from North Dakota but beyond. We're so thrilled that you're here. We've got a big full day and so I won't uh, spend a great deal of time in housekeeping or introductory matters, but just one thing, please, cell phones off um, for people of all ages and please, please no texting. Um, and I don't just mean the young people, I have an 84 year old who texts incessantly as a friend of mine, so uh, please cell phones off. I want to start today, uh, we're going to have a session this afternoon, Dr. McCallum's going to come back for that, uh, in which we premiere this uh, really unbelievable documentary film made in 1919 in western North Dakota by the late Herman Hagedorn, who was the first uh, director of the Theodore Roosevelt Association and the, the author of two books on Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, the Roosevelt Family of Sagamore Hill, which is a central book to any discussion of the Roosevelt family, and also Theodore Roosevelt in the Badlands, which is the uh, most important book about that phase of Roosevelt's life. And so everyone owes her, the late Herman Hagedorn and a great uh, deal uh, for the pioneering work that he did. He was a friend of TR. In fact, when, when Hagedorn came here in 1919 to produce that documentary film, uh, he was carrying a letter of introduction from Theodore Roosevelt himself to Sylvain Ferris, who still lived out in Western Dakota. Uh, and that letter is in the um, in the archives of the Theodore or of the um, Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation. Jim Fugley unearthed it about a year ago. So even though T.R. by now had died on January 6, 1919, he had written this letter of recommendation so that the his old colleagues, his pals from Dakota Territory would welcome this young um, historian and documentary filmmaker. So we won't get a lot of time to talk about Mr. Hagedorn this afternoon because we're going to be so busy watching the, the amazing film that he produced, but I thought that I would read a passage from his book, The Roosevelt Family of Sagamore Hill, because it really sets up our discussion of um, the Roosevelt family. This is from his page 145, and it's about Ted, the oldest of the second batch of children. The oldest of the children was Alice Roosevelt Longworth. She's the tall one in the white hat in the photograph. Ted, uh, the first son of Edith Roosevelt, is the one to her uh, right, uh, on your left, uh, with spectacles uh, standing above his father. And this is a, a moment in Ted's life that I think reflects on what I suppose could be called the burden of being Roosevelt. Uh, there was uh, an old man um, who lived near um, Sagamore on, at Oyster Bay and the following uh, conversation took place, says Hagedorn. An odd friendship had grown up between this determined 14-year-old, Ted, and the old man, and the boy had revealed to him uneasy depths which possibly he had not revealed to his father. We've had many a talk, the old townsman remarked, Ted said to me one day, don't you think it handicaps a boy to be the son of a man like my father, and especially to have the same name? I asked him what he meant, and he went on, why don't you know there can never be another Theodore Roosevelt? I will always be honest and upright, and I hope someday to be a great soldier, but I will always be spoken of as Theodore Roosevelt's son. The old man replied with a cheery prediction of glories to come, unaware that he had been given a long glimpse down a cloudy vista. Ted was, in fact, already suffering the penalty 
of being Theodore Roosevelt's son, it was some comfort but not enough to thrash the schoolmate who called him the first boy in the land. I wish my father would soon be done holding office, Ted said in deep disgust to his father's friend, Jacob Reese. I'm sick and tired of it. Uh, his prediction that he would maybe someday be a great soldier proved true. He fought not only uh, with distinction in World War I, but later in World War II. So one of the things we're, we're examining in this symposium is what was it like to be a Roosevelt? The easy assumption is that it, what, what TR said as he left the White House in 1909, I promise you that no family has ever enjoyed living in the White House as much as we Roosevelts have done. And there's a sense of the rambunctious family filled with mutual love and respect and with great hijinks and you know, a very strong um, commitment to letting children be children and uh, parents who are willing to play, play football, play point to point, go rowing, uh, wrestle, tussle, etc. And all that's true. But surely what Ted is saying is also true, that being the son of a great man is always difficult, or a daughter, um, being uh, a member of the first family of the country is difficult. And with a, with a father like Roosevelt, and, and I dare say mother like Edith, there was, a, there was a huge pressure for those young people to excel, particularly in physical terms. So we want to be examining some of those issues over the next uh, day and a half, and we're so fortunate that we get to begin uh, with one of the most uh, remarkable uh, Roosevelt scholars in the United States, Stacy Cordery. Uh, Stacy Cordery uh, is the author of um, three Roosevelt-related books. Uh, she holds uh, all of her degrees from the University of Texas at Austin, um, a BA in theater, 1983, an MA in history, 1986, and a PhD in history in 1992. Uh, she's a professor of history at Monmouth College in Monmouth, Illinois. Uh, she um, has written uh, three books that matter to us, one of which is the subject of today's talk. Her first book is the book that I noticed first and, and really very much admire, Theodore Roosevelt in the Vanguard of the Modern. That was 2003. Uh, in 2007, she edited a book called Historic Photographs of Theodore Roosevelt. And in 2007, um, her great and um, pioneering biography of Alice, uh, appeared Alice, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, from White House Princess to Washington Power Broker. She's now working on a biography of Juliet Gordon Lowe, the founder of the Girl Scouts. We are so fortunate to have you. Please welcome Stacy Cordery. All right, so I am, um, going to talk today about Alice Roosevelt Longworth, but here's the trick. Alice lived to be 96 years old. I have about 50 minutes to talk to you. <laughs> so clearly I can't do every part of her life. That would, uh, be, uh, that, would, that would set us so far back, Clay would never forgive me. So what I'm going to try to do is concentrate on her, um, on the first daughter years. And I want to concentrate on the first daughter years because Clay Jenkinson came up with this fabulous title, um, Alice Blues, which is a great double entendre. Um, because the first daughter years when she was in the White House are, is the period where she made her parents the most blue. So I thought we should concentrate on that. And then um, afterwards at the panel and other times during the, the symposium, there'll be time to talk about other uh, aspects of her life. So I want to um, jump in by reminding us of um, Aha. Alice's parents. This is Alice Hathaway Lee and a very young Theodore Roosevelt, not uh, too long after they met. And here's um, Alice Lee when, um, when she was married. And so Alice, of course, was the daughter of a Boston um, elite family. She was the daughter of a Boston banker. She married a, a, the son of an elite New York family. And uh, together they produced this beautiful child. Alice Roosevelt, um, who is called Alice Lee Roosevelt, born, as I'm sure most of you know, in, um, uh, in February of 1884. And then two days later, her mother uh, died. So Alice was then 
handed to Theodore Roosevelt's sister, Anna, called Bai or Bammy. This is quite logical. Um, Bai was the spinster sister, so she had um, no other um, obvious duties that she had to tend to. Here's Alice. Nice clothes, huh? So she was spoiled rotten um, by Auntie Bai. Of course she would have been. I mean, she's the poor little Alice, right? She's just lost her mother and so forth. So, but truthfully, from everything we can tell, they loved each other. Alice loved um, Auntie Bai. Auntie Bai doted on Alice till she was an adult. She called her my little blue-eyed darling. I mean, it was very touching. <laughs> So this was a good period in Alice's life, um, not that she remembered too much of it being this young, but important events happen um, certainly uh, when they're young, you know, when, when you're this young, you, you lay the groundwork for uh, much of the rest of your life. Well, then, the next, <coughs> I can't, there we go. The next thing that happens, of course, is she has to ready herself to meet her new stepmother. And her new stepmother is Edith Kermit Corot. Theodore Roosevelt fell in love or fell back in love with his uh, high school sweetheart, depends on how you uh, like the story. And so uh, Edith here then married Theodore Roosevelt. But I show this picture now because when Edith um, believed it was her duty to raise her new husband's daughter, she's very duty driven, was Edith. Uh, but when Alice joined that couple, Edith was already pregnant. And Alice confessed that she felt often like the outsider in the nursery, that she was never quite one of the gang the way the others were one of the gang. And sometimes this was very good for her. She liked being special and different. And sometimes it wasn't so great. Well, one of the ways we can see she's different is Alice was an avid reader. And she's the only child who grew up having full run of her father's library. Um, she never went to formal school, at least not for long. She was um, essentially an autodidact. She was trained at her, at her parents' uh, knee, and she read, in this case, a very wide and sometimes you could say odd assortment of books. And sometimes she did them for all the wrong reasons. She read the Bible several times through just to say she had. Um, but I think this is interesting because this is one of the ways that Alice's difference set her off. And she will regret this. She will, as an adult, say, I'm sorry that I didn't get a proper training like my siblings got. OK, I'm going to fast forward now. When Theodore becomes president of the United States in 1901, and Edith becomes first lady, Alice was catapulted into first daughter Dumb, first daughter of the land. And look, she's all grown up. Alice was not um, any old 17-year-old at this point in time. She had, for one thing, hit that kind of sulky 17-year-old uh, stage. And when her father became president, she told everyone that being first daughter of the land was the last thing she wanted to do. Thank you very much. But she also secretly really wanted him to be president, just like all of her siblings did. Alice, like uh, the others, heard about McKinley's death, and then did a little jig of happiness. <laughs> then they had to quickly put on the proper face to you know, look like they were properly mourning for McKinley. Well, the, uh, the desire not to be first daughter was quickly supplanted by a desire to be first daughter, because Alice began to count up the delicious opportunities inherent in, the, in this position, starting with making her debut in the White House. She and her stepmother stopped butting heads long enough to plan this important event. It's the first time you can see from this headline that a debutante ball had happened in the White House. The, the, the debut was a lavish, probably a bigger party than any, most of us have had in, in this room. But the debutante herself was only moderately pleased with it because she couldn't have a cotillion. And a cotillion was a kind of a dance where you gave out presents. Alice was all about the presents. So she couldn't have a cotillion. And she wanted to be a big, big, big party. And Edith and Theodore said, mm, no, this is going to be a family party. So there were some other troubles. The White House was being remodeled. And she didn't have the dance floor she wanted. And so she said later, I myself enjoyed it modestly. <laughs> this introduced her to society. But what introduced her to the world was the uh, visit of this man. This is uh, Prince Henry of Prussia who came to the United States because he was there to uh, pick up the yacht that belonged to the, uh, his relative, Kaiser Wilhelm. And Alice had been pegged to christen this yacht. 
which she did. She practiced smashing uh, champagne bottles in her backyard so she'd make sure she got it right. But she really enjoyed all the fanfare surrounding this. Um, Prince Henry here was supposed to be marriage material, but when he got here, it turned out he was not only too old, he was also married. That was problematic. But Alice, Alice was um, invited to dinner. It's not this one, this is a men's dinner. You can see the, print, the prints over here in this regalia. But Alice liked all the dinners. She liked all the press. She liked the flowers. She loved the diamonds he gave her. And so she conducted herself so well during this weekend. And all the international newspapers were watching her, of course, because um, Germany's enemies and Germany's allies, as you might imagine, were all paying close attention to this visit. Um, Alice was given the nickname Princess Alice. And she hated the name Princess Alice sometimes. Because sometimes she loved the name Princess Alice. It all depended on where she was in her life. So what I wanted to say about this, when Prince Henry left, Alice's fame just grew and grew and grew. And then the Roosevelt family began to look around to see what kind of advantages that this position could um, afford their daughter. Alice, for her part, I believe, looked to the mounting adulation of anonymous Americans as a substitute for the attention she never fully got from her parents. I think Alice really wanted uncomplicated and uh, sort of over-the-top concentrated love, and she never got it from, from either one of her Okay, now, publicity was easy to come by when you were Alice at this age because her time in the White House intersected with an increase in the popular press. Not to mention that her father was the master at uh, media manipulation. So she watched and learned, and she saw what he did. And so, Princess Alice became the kind of new standard for exciting headlines because she became known for a string of extraordinary behaviors. For example, she began to smoke. This was not what a well-behaved well young woman of this era did. And Theodore Roosevelt put his foot down, which he rarely did, and he said, Alice, no daughter of mine will smoke in the White House. And she said, that's all right, Father. And she climbed to the roof and smoked on the roof of the White House. <laughs> Alice um, carried a snake to dinner parties. She had a pet snake, and she put it in her, in her little purse. And when dinner parties got boring, she opened the purse, and she let the snake slither down the, the dining table to liven things up. Next slide, please. Alice went to the races, went to horse races. And this was not necessarily so bad, but she bet on the horses. And she even was photographed um, caught in the act of accepting her earnings from her bookie. Again, not what you hope for in the first daughter. Next slide, please. Horses were great for Alice at, at the racetrack, but she um, very quickly traded her horse that she rode, next slide, for a automobile, not this one exactly. Alice didn't want just any automobile. Alice wanted the new Red Devil Speedster. It was a gasoline powered, not an electric powered car. And she drove it very fast and she got speeding tickets. Um, that's fine. And so Alice did all sorts of things that got her in, in, in trouble. Um, or that got her mentioned in the newspapers, depending on your point of view. She had a little cunning pocket pistol, she said, which she used to shoot off from the back of trains as she went um, visiting people. She jumped fully clad into a swimming pool. She danced the hoochie coochie, the turkey trot, the hula, whatever was the newest dance. And her name was always um, in the paper linked to other men as though she were going to be marrying them. And this made Edith crazy. Of course, it was not true. Um, next slide, please. Young Americans particularly loved the first daughter. They saw her autograph, they wanted her photograph, they wanted her autograph photograph. They began to turn up in crowds wherever she went. Alice could bring out crowds of hundreds and hundreds of people. And by the time she was shopping for her trousseau in New York City, thousands of people came to see Alice Longworth. This is, this is unheard of. I mean, this is a very modern phenomenon, this kind of celebrity. So while Alice is in the front pages, guess who's not on the front pages? Oh, yeah, Dad. <laughs> Next slide, please. This is a comic. Alice was on occasion in comic strips. That blue arrow is pointing to Alice's hat. She wore these, these big hats um, when she was young, and there was kind of a trademark. And this is when Alice came to town. And all surrounding her are newspaper photographers, so you get a sense of what it was like to be Alice. Soon there grew a market for Alice-inspired goods. Anything Alice Blue was, uh, would, would sell out. Alice Blue was a color named after Alice. It was supposed to be for the steel gray color of her eyes. Next slide, please. There were songs named after Alice. This is sheet music. 
Uh, next song, next slide, please. This is another uh, song called uh, "The American Girl," and you can see Theodore Roosevelt like buglers, 1898 sort of buglers there. Um, next slide, please. Here's a postcard, one of the many postcards that had the first daughter on them. You could even get Alice inside your chocolate bar. Next slide. This is the back of a French chocolate bar. So, like you get like a baseball card today, you could open up your candy bar. And here's the front. Next slide, please. Hand tinted. <laughs> So the point is, you could see Alice everywhere. And her father and mother were very unhappy about this. They accused her of courting publicity. Alice said, who's courting publicity? All I have to do is step outside the White House. And the media appears. I'm not courting publicity. But secretly, she said, but you know what? If dad can do this, why can't I? Next slide, please. Theodore Roosevelt, no, that's it. Stop it. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt said, do not like, he wrote her letter, do not like the advertisements of you appearing at a portrait show. They distinctly convey the impression that any person who wishes to pay $5 may be served tea by you. I cannot consent to such use of your name and must ask you not to serve tea. But Alice wanted to serve tea. She wanted to participate. This was a charity event. And so she sweetly telegraphed her father that his note had arrived too late. <laughs> It was actions like all these I just described that made Theodore Roosevelt famously say to Owen Wister, next slide please, I can be President of the United States or I can attend to Alice. I cannot possibly do both. <laughs> the attention Theodore Roosevelt could spare for Alice was usually in the form of lectures about that courting publicity or about staying out too late or about not having serious enough interest. And Alice said, I was interested in everything that concerned father. I knew what was going on, probably because I could not have avoided knowing. I met all the people who came to the White House. I heard them talk. I talked with them. And I think I had an adequate pattern. But truth compels me to state that my major preoccupation was to have a good time. And a good time to me meant consorting with people of my own age, total irresponsibility, and perpetual rushing from place to place from one amusement to the other with the curiosity of a puppy and as little sense of direction. <laughs> well, Roosevelt finally found a way to give his headstrong daughter some kind of direction. And that was travel. Or maybe it was just a way to refocus the spotlight on him. Next slide, please. Only a few months after her debut, the first daughter went to Cuba. And it turned out that the um, Cubans had official expectations for Alice. And she was not there as an ordinary American. It was very clear that Cubans saw her as the daughter of um, you know, the hero of Kettle Hill and the president of the United States. So in fact, what she did in Cuba was to travel as her father's goodwill ambassador. Alice was the first first daughter to take on this role of goodwill ambassador. When she was in Cuba, for example, she viewed a school for orphans. She presided over some charity receptions. She attended teas and parties and balls and had um, you know, cavalry, re cav cavalry reviews given in her honor. Um, and she loved every minute of it. Turns out she was also very good at it. And so she began to do more and more traveling. Um, she couldn't always go where she wanted to do because being first daughter meant that any trip outside the country was fraught with international implications. It, it was, she couldn't go, for example, to England because the Irish Americans in uh, uh, the Irish Americans here wanted that to be a statement about England's bad treatment of Ireland, and TR said, "Forget it. I'm looking at three bags of mail piled up from Irish American voters, and so you can't go." But she managed to get to New Orleans. She went to um, Boston quite a bit, which is where her mother's relatives also spoiled her. Um, and she went to Newport, uh, where the male factors of, of great wealth hung out. Those are the people Theodore Roosevelt didn't like. In fact. No one in the family thought very highly of these very, very wealthy Americans, with the possible exception of Auntie Bai. In Newport, Alice bet more, smoked more, bet more rules, and constantly worried about not having enough money to keep up with the likes of the Vanderbilts. But she also had some Washington friends who really annoyed her parents. She was running with a pretty fast crowd that consisted principally of um, Marguerite Cassini, who was the daughter of the Russian ambassador, and Sissy Patterson. Um, next slide, please. Here's some sheet music. Can I have the next slide, please? Here's some sheet music that recognizes Alice's friendship with um, Margaret Cassini. These three women, young women, were called the Three Graces. And I just want to tell you that Jenna and Barbara Bush had nothing on these three women. <laughs> Maggie taught Alice and Sissy how to smoke. Alice taught Maggie and Sissy how to play poker. Sissy taught Alice and Maggie how to dance the latest dances. 
This kind of stuff made Edith and T.R. furious. And neither Edith nor T.R. was above making hurtful comparisons between um, certain other young women, cousins even, like Eleanor, who were more socially conscious, who were uh, better people, were doing better things with their lives. So unlike Ale um, Eleanor, cousin Eleanor, who was, uh, Professor Dalton told you last night, was um, you know, working in the tenements and doing good, Alice was in the paper for her whirlwind schedule, for her appearances at dances, uh, parties, and, and uh, social and official events. With and without her friends, she was in the paper, but it was never for her good works. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite comments of Alice, and I know that it doesn't show up very well, but it's called Alice, Where Art Thou? And, and what's happening here is that this is a horse race, and everything has stopped. Even the horses have stopped. The babies have stopped crying. And everyone in this whole thing is looking back this way because Alice is up there in the stand somewhere. She's not even in this comic. Alice, where art thou? So every time Alice managed to be uh, out and about, she got herself in the newspaper. Now, one of the things the first these, these three young women were trying to do, of course, was to get a husband because that's what young women of her class did in that era. Um, Alice fell in and out of love, next slide please, with amazing regularity as a, as a young girl. This is a, her diary from 1900, but it looked like this throughout the first daughter years as well. And you see she kept track of all the little hearts she broke. She called them heartlets, these little heartlets. And she numbered them. If you're close enough, you can see this is number 27. The poor guy's name is Harold. But Alice had a real hard time, actually, trying to um, meet young men while she was in the White House. She had no place to meet them, for one, because the White House was full of, well, her parents and reporters and anybody else couldn't come in and notice who the first daughter was with. And even, so she met them at, at Auntie Vi's house. And even when she did meet young men, she worried that they liked her because she was first daughter, but not really for who she was. And she worried about her friends, her, her women friends, in the same way. Well, this gets problematic. This whole hunt for a husband gets problematic because it turns out the three graces, all of them had set their sight on, next slide, Nicholas. Next slide, Longworth of Ohio. He may not look it to you, but this was America's most eligible bachelor. <laughs> well, all this comes together in 1905. Alice is a celebrity, her love of travel, her fears about finding a man who loved her for herself. It all comes together because Alice was not exactly a problem in the White House, uh, but her ability to attract attention had become what Edith and T.R. labeled a distraction for the family. Now, Theodore Roosevelt loved Alice, I've no doubt about that, and he wanted to see all of his children happy. So he hit upon an excellent plan for using her obvious charms and her nascent diplomatic skills to a good advantage. Um, and he also, uh, this was also the thing that got her out of the spotlight. Next slide, please. He sent her away. Next slide, please. Thanks. He sent her away in 1905 on a trip to the Far East. And this um, happened because Roosevelt was in the middle of negotiating a peace between Russia and Japan. And the president wanted to send a high-level delegation to, to the, uh, East Asia. And he decided to send along his daughter as an experienced goodwill ambassador. She was thrilled about this. Uh, next slide, please. This poor man, William Hart Taft was Alice's chaperone. <laughs> so on the 1st of July, 1905, with 75 congressmen and their wives, newspaper reporters, and Alice, and Nick, but not Sissy, and not Maggie, they all left. Next slide, please. It was the first time Alice had been west of Mississippi. Their first stop was San Francisco. Taft recorded, there was a great curiosity to see Alice Roosevelt. And so, like she did in Cuba, she met uh, influential Californians, she had formal duties during the day, at night she played poker. Um, newspapers reported that she escaped her chaperone for a brief excursion through the fringes of Chinatown, which was infamous at the time. Although, as she wrote to her father, I did not go to Chinatown in San Francisco. And I treated with scorn all invitations to do so. Apparently, she didn't need to go there because, as she told TR, there was an opium den and a gambling place on board the ship. But she said, she said, I hasten to assure you that I have frequented neither one of them. So see, she had to write this letter to her father because for once what they, what they wrote in the paper was so scandalous that Alice had to say, had to set the record straight. All right, next slide, please. They went to Honolulu, um, where Alice really learned how to truly dance the hula and how to surfboard. 
Then, next slide, please. They went to Yokohama. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, they went to Yokohama. Here's uh, Secretary of War Taft and um, Alice uh, getting up the boat in Yokohama. Alice said Yokohama was bonsai all the way. The Japanese lined the roads. They waved American flags. They cheered for Alice. And Alice loved seeing the lands that she had read about as a young girl come alive before her eyes. She was very excited about this trip. Um, she was, uh, next slide, please. She was met by a raft of, of royalty. You can see Alice in the middle here. Uh, she's flanked by the Princess of the East and the Princess of the West. And her female chaperone is this weary looking woman here on the end. <laughs> and then behind is uh, William Taft. He's in the light colored suit. Alice and Taft were treated like royal guests wherever they went. Um, Alice remembered, uh, the next slide please, this was a, a garden party um, in Japan. She said she thought that we looked like a slightly stoned version of the ascot scene from My Fair Lady. <laughs> she wrote her father, quote, we have seen geisha dancing, wrestling, jujitsu, fencing, and acting. Next slide, please. She said, I don't think it would be possible to see more in six weeks than we have put into six days. And you do know what you're looking at. Is, can you tell what you're looking at? These are sumo wrestlers. It's hard to tell. This is not a part of a man's anatomy that a first daughter should see. <laughs> and here she is, right in the big middle. <laughs> okay, so Alice, um, okay, so Alice was having a good time on her official duties, and Japan, meanwhile, is not going to like the final outcome of the peace treaty. But this was not clear at the, at the moment she was visiting. So, next slide, please. They, um, uh, Alice and, and everyone went to visit uh, the Mikado. The, they they uh, had an unusual meeting with him. Alice was given the rare honor of seeing his private garden. She sat on his right hand at lunch. And there were many more admiring crowds in uh, Tokyo than in Kyoto. Taft said every member of the party was cheered to the echo in Kyoto, especially Alice. And along the way, I should add, Alice picked up so many presents that her friend Willard Strait began to call her Alice in Plunderland. <laughs> After the signing of the treaty that concluded the war between uh, Rus uh, Russia and um, Japan, uh, a Japanese newspaper wrote this. Miss Alice Roosevelt, upon whose intelligence and resolute character the Americans pride themselves, frequently renders assistance to the president in delicate missions where tact and diplomacy are required. This visit must be considered as one of the happy preliminaries of a peace so swiftly concluded. Next slide. They went to the Philippines. And uh, this was the Phil Philippines was Taft's real reason for making the trip. Roosevelt, as Taft put it, wanted to inspire the people of the islands um, and show him his interest in them and his confidence in their hospitality and cordial reception of his daughter. Of course, we just concluded a, a war um, in the Philippines. I have to laugh at that quote I read you because <laughs> Roosevelt said he was going to uh, show his confidence in their hospitality and cordial reception of his daughter. So what did he think? If he sent his daughter that they wouldn't have ugly, horrible responses to the American presence, and that was okay to put your daughter there, in case? I don't know. Um, the Next slide, please. She stayed in this palace, and next slide, thanks. In this palace, and she shook hundreds of hands, and she had receptions and banquets and speeches and balls. The Washington Post said, the eyes of the whole world are upon her, representing as she does not only the chief executive of our nation, but the typical American girl. <laughs> okay, next slide please. The one thing she did do, a strenuous daughter of a strenuous sire, is to spend a fortnight spreading American goodwill around the remote areas of the Philippines. And this really was roughing it. She could live a strenuous life. Next slide please. Back on ship, the delegation sailed to Hong Kong. They were met by more cheers. Um, Alice decided that she wanted to see Canton, despite the, the uh, Chinese boycott of American goods that threatened our relationship with China at the time. Next slide, please. That's Nick and Alice you're looking at. This poster was um, all over where Alice went, and it is a poster that is aimed at the um, rickshaw drivers, and it says, don't carry the daughter of the American president. This is supposed to be Alice here in the middle, and these are the rickshaw drivers. And, and so I think this is very clear evidence that Alice was not just your average American girl. She was not your typical American girl. Um, this poster, by the way, I should tell you, Alice took this poster down and it hung in her living room till the day she died. <laughs> um, next slide, please. 
Um, after a while, the, the, uh, the party separated, and uh, Nick and Alice, with uh, the female chaperone and some other friends, went on to um, China. Next slide, please. Where they got to see, uh, meet this woman, the formidable um, Dowager Empress of China. Alice, she had tremendous power and was happy to show her power. But Alice quite liked her because um, uh, Su Shi here showered Alice with very expensive presents. Um, Alice got to stroll through her garden. Well, actually, Alice didn't stroll. Everybody else walked. Alice was held aloft by four bearers on, the, on like a royal litter. That was great fun, too. Next slide, please. When um, they left China, they went then to Korea, spent 10 days in Korea, where Alice said, I am now more than fed up with official entertaining, with being treated, one may say, as temporary royalty. Next slide, please. The real royalty as, next slide. Next slide, thanks. Um, the real royalty, as far as Americans was concerned, was at where it was Alice and Nick. So here's Alice laughing. You don't often see Alice laugh. And if you are a student of Alice, you notice that you hardly ever see her smiling because she smoked her whole life and her teeth were um, yellowed. But here's a, a good picture of Alice and Nick on board ship where they're having a good time. And this was unusual, apparently, because the um, courtship between the first daughter and Congressman Longworth was not going well. Uh, even though there were headlines like Tropical Romance Anticipated, uh, William Howard Taft did not trust Nick Longworth at all. And I should tell you they're neighbors, they're both from Cincinnati. But Taft doubted the validity, the longevity, the purpose of Nick's courtship. He wrote to his wife, Alice tells me she's engaged to Nick. They are a curious pair of lovers. I don't think that either is much in love with the other. She is very young, childish, and undisciplined. But if she were under someone's good influences, she could be made into a fine woman. As it is, Nick's influence over her is not good. Alice is quite a favorite abroad, but everyone thinks Nick unworthy of her. Everyone that is, except TR, who saw Nick as, a, as an older man, he's about 14 years older, as a kind of a steadying influence on his daughter. Next slide, please. Well, as you know, they eventually did uh, have a, they concluded their courtship successfully. Nick proposed, he was never quite sure when he proposed, and there are lots of funny newspaper stories about when he proposed. But once their wedding plans were announced, the floodgates opened. Alice called the two months between their engagement and the wedding a turmoil. This was a postcard. It looked just like this, and on the back it was addressed to Alice. So you didn't even have to address it. You just put a stamp on it, and you sent it to her and said, congratulations on your wedding. Next slide, please. Here's a, a song written about them. Um, the two, uh, the two uh, principal actors here, Alice and Nick, um, finally uh, walked out the door on the 17th of February, 1906. It was a spectacular extravaganza of a wedding. It was a very brief wedding. Um, but so she embarked on her destiny with uh, lots and lots and lots of presents. Next slide, please. She got, from her old friend, she got some great presents from um, world leaders. Next slide, please. But she also got some interesting presents because she was a kind of, um, she was one of us. By this time, Alice had won over the hearts of most Americans, and they really loved her. Next slide, please. So she got um, all sorts of presents and uh, hundreds of presents. She did not write her own thank you notes. There were too many. She eventually wrote a few, but not very many. Next slide, please. Of course, the other baggage that she um, started, or the other baggage, did I say baggage? The other, thing, the other thing she began her life with, besides all these presents, um, was this kind of ambivalence towards Nick, and they will not have a happy marriage. This photograph was the one released to the papers, and if you can see it, I think she looks exhausted and miserable. In my book, there's, uh, I found one picture of Alice holding a dog on her lap. The dog was a present from Sushi, and she looks slightly happier with this young puppy, with the puppy on her lap. But I, I think this is a kind of a, even given the era when she wouldn't have smiled, I think she looks tired and sad. Next slide, please. Asphalt, I really like this one because look who's leaning away. <laughs> there's Nick on, on, on this side, Alice in the middle, and there's TR like this. Yeah, okay. Bye. <laughs> well, people assumed that marriage would stop Alice from her crazy antics, would settle her down, would stop her being the first daughter. In fact, Alice was always the first daughter. She would go on to have a fascinating life. She lived in the center of Washington politics. Next slide, please. She and Nick would become leaders of Washington society. She would surround herself with some of the world's most interesting people. She fought political battles. She wrote a memoir. She campaigned a little bit. Next slide, please. She led the, next slide, please. She led the anti-Franklin uh, forces in Washington during the New Deal and World War II years. 
But from 1906, she was, from 1906 to 1919, when Alice left the White House and before TR died, Alice was much closer to her father than she had been before. Next slide, please. In many ways, she's very much like her father. And what I want to do is um, conclude by giving you some thoughts about Alice and TR that I did not put in my book because I am a historical biographer, but I am not a psychologist. And um, psychohistory has a kind of a bad smell in the eyes of many historians. But you know when you work on a book for 20 some years, you can't help it but sort of fade in and out of their head. Um, and so I have given a lot of thoughts to the relationship between TR and Alice. And in some ways, since we're talking about the, the TR as a father and this whole symposium is about family, I just want to kind of put out some ideas of mine and then you're, um, all, I hope you all talk about them, think about them, and, um, and give me some other ideas as well. All right, so next slide, please. I think it is wrong to reduce Alice to nothing more than a reaction to her father, but it would be just as wrong to deny his effect on her. Um, if you look at her life through a kind of a TR lens, I, I, these things are of interest to me. His guilt about his remarriage that um, Dr. Dalton spoke about last night, meant she never really adjusted to, as healthily as possible, to her mother's death. They, they never talked about it. Theodore Roosevelt never said his wife's name. Um, they never sat down and had a heart to heart about what it meant that her mother was gone. You know, there was not, none of that that we would, that's very modern, certainly, but that could have happened then. Um, and then T.R.'s remarriage to a woman who was clearly not cut out to be the mother of Alice. Edith herself said, I am not the best mother for this high-spirited child. So his remarriage to a woman who wasn't cut out to be the mother of Alice, coupled with his distance, meant that Alice lacked their undivided attention. Then lacking their undivided attention, she sought it elsewhere. And I think, I hope I've shown you, she got it from the public. His guilt and Edith's unwillingness to put her foot down compromised Alice's education. Who knows what she would have done if she had a, a proper education because she was very, very smart. People, all, pe most people said she was the smartest of all of TR's children. Neither Edith nor TR knew how to handle her as she became a teenager. Um, there was uh, not enough communication. Alice, Alice wrote about this in her diary and other places. So they let her go her own way. Um, and I'm not sure that this was necessarily the best thing to happen to her. She also married a father figure, which she talked about herself. Uh, but she married a father figure who was just as distant as her real father was to her. And also, Nick Longworth occupied in his family the same place that Theodore Roosevelt occupied in his family. If you were here last night and you heard Dr. Dalton speak, you know that um, the, the women of the family doted on him. Um, Nick's two sisters called Nick the firstborn of Israel. <laughs> Okay, so Nick has that same kind of doting females in his family that TR had, and that's who she married. Now, you know, then in a marriage like this, where Alice is a big personality and a big ego, and Nick is used to being the center of everything, is it gonna work? Okay, but I think she, you know, lots of us marry our, our, our you know, women marry their fathers, and whatever, okay. I think that maybe have happened. So in place of the solid love that Ethel had from her father, so Ethel had solid, uncomplicated love from her father, Alice, I think, began to crave kind of a power that, so she could um, have some kind of power over a situation she was mostly powerless over. Hence, I think her friends her place at the epicenter of, of Washington, D.C., but without the, the self-esteem to go into politics herself. And she could have. It would have been an unusual career for a woman at that era and very unusual for a woman of her background, but she could have. But Alice loved what T.R. loved. Politics, the science, the environment. She embraced progressivism when he was its hero. She, in 1912, Alice chose her father over her husband. In 1912, when TR formed the Progressive Party, Nick remained in the Republican Party. She cast her lot with her father and the Progressives. She led the defeat of the League of Nations as an older woman, in part as a memorial to her father. Um, and I don't know how much of that was her own thinking and how much of that was it, that TR first championed a, a different kind of League of Nations than President Wilson did. She did not abort her own child when she could have. Alice was pregnant. <coughs> Nick Longworth was not the father. Alice could have had an abortion. She didn't. Why? 
Now, it was a different era, so the scandal that would have attached itself to that sort of thing happening today didn't happen. Um, but Alice grew up hearing about the Race Suicide Club, and she grew up with TR's belief that you should have a big family. Well, Alice finally, at age 40, got pregnant, but her husband wasn't the father. But she had the baby anyway, at age 40. Different medical system. I find this very interesting. So she had the child. Um, she also did not divorce Nick. Uh, there were many times when, when she could have divorced Nick in 1912, she wanted to. She did not divorce Nick. Was this because of her father's position on marriage and his beliefs, or was this the era, or was it something else? I think there are many more ties you can make, but in the interest of time, I'll just say, people always ask me about Alice's daughter, her only child, Paulina. It's a very sad story. Alice was a terrible mother. She was really a failure as a mother. But I wonder if this is something she came by honestly. TR may have been a good father to his sons, if you don't count Ted's breakdown, but he was perhaps not an ideal father to his eldest daughter. I, I, I think she needed a kind of attention from him she never got. Um, if he was her role model as a parent, no wonder she failed. Edith was not a good role model as a parent. Auntie Bai turns out not to have been a good role model as a parent. Not that Alice didn't make something of her life. She did. But as her biographer, I've always been pursued by the thought that she might have done other things or different things had she had different parents. Um, on the other hand, as uh, Kathleen Dalton said last night, Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, had a much worse childhood, more worse in every way, and she did lots of things with her life. But you know what Alice would say to that, right? Yeah, but who was really happy? Eleanor was miserable. I lived a happy life. So I don't know whether you, in the balance, say it's better to have lived a, a not so happy but productive life or a really happy, more hedonistic life. Um, I don't know where that takes us. But I want to leave you with these um, thoughts only because, like I said, this is what professors do. We, we need to muddy the waters and make you go, oh, I thought I had that all figured out. Now I don't. Because that's when we succeeded. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take questions. Alice's mother when she married T.R.? I don't know. 18 or so. There you go. Betty Crowley says 18 or so. Did Nick have money? And did Nick have any money? Nick had, Nick had money. He came from a family in Ohio that um, uh, had uh, some land and they, had, uh, they were known for their wine. They raised wine. And uh, Nick was not the generation to make so much money, although he was an attorney. He was more interested in politics. Um, but sadly, when Nick died, Alice was still a fairly young woman, and she learned that Nick had essentially gambled away or drank, <coughs> drunk, drank away the money. So he left her some money, but not very much. Alice's money came from her mother, because her mother, Alice's mother had money from that Boston banking family, but um, the, when her mother died, she got her mother's sh share of that money, but her grandfather gave her uh, basically an allowance, and um, then Alice was going to inherit it all when she came of age. But Alice always overspent her budget, always overspent her budget. And so one day, her grandfather said to her parents, Edith and Theodore, look, I'm going to do an experiment here. Alice keeps spending and spending, and she writes me for money, and you know, luckily her grandfather loved her, so he always sent her checks. Anyway, I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to give her twice as much money, and if she asks me for money at the end of the month, that's it. I'm going to cut her off and put her on allowance, and we'll you can see where this went. She asked for money, spent too much money, and then she was on an allowance to the day she died. <laughs> Alice never, ever got her hands on that money. And it went to then um, her, her granddaughter, that, who, who, but Alice, one of the reasons you don't know Alice for great works of charity is because she could never get more than an allowance of that money. And that money just sat there, now so her granddaughter has got a fair bit of money because Alice's daughter died young, and so she didn't spend that money either, but the granddaughter has that money made way, way back when T.R. and Edith were courting. When did Alice Longwood stop being a political player? About the time she turned 80, uh, 90, sorry, when she turned 90. Her 90th birthday was about the time she, um, her, her mind was going a little bit, um, and that's about the time her, her granddaughter said, okay, you're slowing down enough, and so the 90th birthday was kind of a swan song. But she, she was losing her mind, but only a little bit. She, if you uh, see my book, there's a, um, the last time Alice was at the White House, she was uh, there to see Queen Elizabeth, and there was a, a, a party, and there were, um, there were some, some funny events that happened around this, and one of them was that the Johnsons were there, I think. 
wait, maybe I'm mixing up my stories. But anyway, there was a point in time when Alice saw Mrs. Uh, sorry, she saw Mrs. Johnson, and she said to her, the person with her, "Oh, look, there's Lady Bird. I shall go ask her how Lyndon is." And her chaperone was shocked and said, "Mrs. Longworth, Lyndon Johnson is dead." She said, "Oh." Out missing a beat, Alice said, oh, then I shall ask her how Lyndon was. <laughs> Can I speculate on how her life would have been different if her mother hadn't died? You know, historians, we call that what if history. What if history is so much fun to play after the second glass of wine at a bar? <laughs> then what if her mother hadn't died? Well, you know, all the people who love Edith would tell you that TR's life would have been a disaster because Alice Hathaway Lee was supposedly much more shallow and not as substantial a figure, not, not as intellectual a figure as Edith was. And I don't know if that's true or if she just died too young for us to really know. Um, she was certainly more pliable than Edith was and got along better with the sisters, uh, T.R. sisters. Um, so I, I guess I could spend a lot of time thinking about that, and I have, but I don't know, I, but I don't know at the end of the day. I mean, I bet if I took a poll of all the women in this room, 50% 50, 50 of us would say, love my mother, talk to her every day on the phone, we see eye to eye on everything, and the other 50% would say, yeah, mom, we don't get along so well. So I don't know whether that would have happened, whether Alice's personality would have been changed by having this figure who doted on her, I don't know. And also, I mean, she would have been the oldest then of pro probably other daughters, right, or I mean other children. So then she would have been the oldest child. Can you imagine as Alice is the oldest child traditionally defined? Responsible, serious, the one who takes care of everything. She wasn't that kind of an oldest child because she had these, these half siblings. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, it could play anyway. That's why it's best after a glass of wine. But it's a little early for that. You could see me later. Other questions? There's one here. Yes, sir. Why was Alice so anti-FDR? Why was Alice so anti-FDR? Ooh, that could be a whole hour to itself. Okay, well, actually, she liked Franklin, personally. Um, but she hated his politics. And by that time in Alice's life, she was strong protector of what she saw as her father's legacy, um, even though she wouldn't have put it that way. So Alice believed that like all anti-New Dealers did, that FDR was running the country into the ground, spending money when we didn't have it to spend. Um, she, she was isolationist and believed we should not get involved in World War II, and she in fact headed up the, um, the, the, the leading isolationist organization of the time she was on its board of directors called America First. So she did not like his policies, and she thought he was kind of pompous. And you know his nickname in the family was Feather Duster, FD, Feather Duster, because he was kind of lightweight intellectually. And there was that whole problem of how, you know, Alice's life did not work out right. Alice was supposed to marry the guy who got back into the White House. Well, Nick turned out to be a drunk and a womanizer, and he never got there. Then her brother Ted was supposed to be the one who got back into the White House. Well, Ted, Teapot Dome, other things happened. He did not get into the White House. Then her lover, Bill Bora, senator from Idaho, he was supposed to get into the White House. Bora didn't get into the White House. She didn't bet on a winner until Richard Nixon. <laughs> but Franklin Roosevelt got to the White House. She said, Nemesis, down the river, there they came. The Franklins. Horrible. Eleanor, who had a different pot roast and knitted her way through parties? Ew. You know? Alice said, I leave the good works to, I leave the good works to Eleanor. And she meant that. They were, they were like uh, oil and water until such time as there were tragedies in the family. When there were tragedies, they were together. At Bill Boris's funeral, who was there? Eleanor. So she strongly disliked his policies. She liked Franklin more than she liked Eleanor, because Eleanor was kind of a wet rag. But Franklin knew how to have a good time. Um, OK, did Alice have a favorite among her siblings? And did she ever comment about how Rose, uh, did she comment on what Theodore Roosevelt wrote about how family should be? No to the last question. Yes to the first. And her favorite sibling was Ted, her boon companion, Ted. Her least favorite was are you ready? If you were here last night, who do you think it was? Archie, yes, Archie. Very, Archie was further to the right than Alice. So, and, and that's saying something, because there was a time in her life when Alice was quite reactionary. But she didn't like Archie. She loved Ted, and um, she was also quite close to Kermit. Um, Ethel was close to Kermit, but Alice was close to him, too. Alice sent Kermit money at various times when um, he was down on his luck and so forth. And strangely, um, once they were adults, and once Ethel was married, Alice and Ethel were, were quite good friends as well. 
and they will support one another, particularly after Edith dies, they'll be very close. And there's some wonderful letters between the sisters uh, when, when they're older, which is unusual concerning, I mean, considering how unlike Alice Ethel was. So. Stacy, let me ask you a couple of quick questions to wrap up. Um, this is called upstaging. Watch. Cool. Yes. How, how do we know that TR never talked about his first wife? I mean, it seems virtually historically incomprehensible that an incessant talker like TR would spend a whole lifetime with his eldest child and never, ever mention his first wife. How do we know this? Well, she said that. But she could have just been saying that. Yes, but I don't know Alice to be mendacious. I, I don't know her to be a liar. I, I don't know her to, to tell untruths. So I, I, I mean, I tend to believe what she says in the record. Now, there were things hidden. You know, there were things hidden for good reason. Eleanor's bi autobiography, for example, is more important for what she leaves out than what she puts in. And I think if you, if you know this, but, but other people, um, you know, Kathleen Dalton last night said she's read every single document connected with TR, and she has read more than I have because she did TR's life. And I don't think Kathleen, where'd she go, has seen anything that would contradict this either. But I mean, isn't it just astounding to think that mm. he would never marry the mother, mm. or mention the mother of his child? I don't know. Clay, have you ever been in love? <laughs> But there's a, there's a certain pose in this for Roosevelt, is there not? Maybe there's a pose, and maybe it was truly his first love. I mean, okay, Edith, he grew up with her. They were like, child, they were childhood friends, right? They saw each other, they played in the sandbox together. But Alice, across the room, she may not know it, right? I'm going to marry that girl? I mean, maybe the stars in his eyes were so great, they never fell. And maybe when Alice died, it truly, it truly was a broken heart. And he truly did have to put the X in the diary, draw the veil across it. Maybe... You don't see enough romance movies. <laughs> if this were true, um, if, this, if this were really true, that, that you, you, you said, uh, I think really interestingly, that in some sense maybe Alice never got closure, to use one right. of our terms. Right. And if, if TR never got closure, which we, you would be saying too in this case, then it would have been virtually impossible to, for him to have so successful a second marriage unless Edith was truly a saint. Well, in some ways, Edith was truly a saint. And I also think that it's, it's, it's easy, in some cases, it's easy to compartmentalize things like extreme grief. And, and I think, I'm gonna make a gender stereotype, I think men are better at compartmentalizing as a rule than women are. And I think that he, he, he put a lid on it and put it away. And I think when he walked the floor here and said, I have no constancy, I have no constancy, I think in that sense, he worked that kind of stuff out. What he didn't do was work it out with a little kid, because how do you do that with a three-year-old? Okay, honey, let's talk about this. I think as she got older, she should have, Alice said, I was made to pray by my, by my nanny, by my nurse. I was made to pray for my mother in heaven. Okay, but that, there was no, nothing else. I mean, she had a lock of her hair, which she thought was kind of maudlin, because this had no context for her. And, and psychologists will tell us that children whose parents die always feel guilty about the death of that parent. They feel like they somehow caused it. You know, mom died giving birth to me, it's all my fault. How do you get past that unless some adult says, this isn't your fault? And I know that I'm, um, I'm on the edge of being guilty of ahistoricism because it was a different era, we didn't talk about these things, but in, in fact, I think this is part of what colored her. Before you wrote your biography, there were other biographies of Alice. What did you discover that hadn't previously been known, and how is your biography a different way of seeing her? Well, the, the last biography, the most recent to Alice's, was written by a woman who I think fundamentally did not like Alice. Um, I spent many years not liking Alice, uh, and then came around to at least, I think, an appreciation of her. Um, and so I think there, that, that tone, that timbre is important. I had access to thousands and thousands and thousands of documents, thanks to the goodness of Alice's granddaughter, whose name was Joanna Sturm, and I'm always thrilled to thank her publicly because she let me into her basement and there were just boxes of letters. And um, so I have all kinds of information on topics small and large that no one else had access to, including all the love letters from Senator Bora, which I believe proved the paternity of um, Alice's child. Um, and I'm the first historian ever to write about her too. 
the, the, before the most immediate one to mine, the other folks knew Alice. So they, they had a different take on her. And then what has, has, has there been a reaction? What's been the reception of the book? Has there been any pushback? What do you mean by pushback? Well, it would be possible for the Roosevelt family not to like this biography very oh. much. Oh, well, um, no. The Roosevelts to whom I've spoken, or who've spoken to me about this, um, said that they liked it. I mean, the thing about this is she lived to be 96, right? So people, the Roosevelt family members and others who knew her, um, are experts on, Al, on the Alice they knew. But I'm the expert, if you will, on Alice as a seven-year-old or a 15-year-old or a 27-year-old or a 33-year-old because nobody's around who knew her at that age. So as much as any historian could ever be an expert, and I use that in you know, quotes. But Joanna, Alice's granddaughter, did not read the book, will never read the book. She will not read any book about her grandmother. She wants to sort of keep intact her own sense of her grandmother and doesn't want to know this other stuff. So Joanna, but Joanna's daughter named Alice, Joanna's daughter Alice read it and Alice likes it. She's um, a college student. I wish we had more time to go on. We will have a, a break of 15 minutes, but how about Stacy Cordery?